Hello, I'm Keaton Bell, an NSF Astronomy and Astrophysics Postdoctoral Fellow at the University of Washington. I'm here to talk to you about finding frequencies of variability in Zwicky transient facility data and to introduce some Python tools that make the process easy. I'll be talking through parts of the Jupyter Notebook that is provided as part of this tutorial. I think this process is as much an art as a science, and finding correct answers and avoiding common pitfalls comes with intuition honed over hours and hours of experimenting with data. This tutorial is a great place to get started. I will demonstrate the use of specialized Python packages like AstroQuery, ZTFQuery, LightCurve, and Pyrid for accessing published data tables, downloading ZTF light curves, manipulating those light curves, and performing pre-whitening frequency analysis, which will be the focus of this tutorial. Don't forget to activate the Jupyter Notebook extensions required by Pyrid before booting up your notebook server, and call the Jupyter magic command matplotlib widget in the first notebook cell. So first we'll download a table of variable stars from Chen et al. That's a pretty big table, so it takes a while to, to download, a few minutes. I already have it loaded and formatted here. This notebook is set up for you to roll the dice on a random data set, and I've picked out a decent one to demonstrate frequency analysis with for this video. As we can see here, this object is classified as a uh, eclipsing contact binary. Those uh, definitions are up here. Uh, with an orbital period of about half a day. If we download this light curve data with ZTF query, you'll need an URSA account to do this. And if we plot the magnitudes measured for this system over time, we see that there's decent annual coverage in the R and G filters and one year of I-band photometry. Because of the different mean magnitudes and potentially different variability amplitudes in each of these different filters, we'll just look at one for now. I'll take the R-band data here and only use points that are not flagged for potentially being unreliable. There are more advanced ways to fit data from all the different filters simultaneously, and I recommend at least fitting light curves from each filter separately and comparing the results for consistency. This is what Chen et al. did, and you can see the values measured here in each the G and R band, the periods, are consistent. Uh, that's always a good idea. Okay, well, Pyriad likes its data to be in terms of flux, and so we will convert the magnitude values into relative flux values next. Um, then we shove the data into a light curve dot light curve object, which expects uh, time flux and flux error measurements in the time series. Here's a plot of the G-band data in normalized brightness and normalized flux units, representing relative deviations from the mean. Now we're ready to pass this along to Pyrid, the frequency analysis package uh, based on uh, the legacy code period 04. This will allow us to measure frequencies interactively. Pyriad has four different interactive cells inspired by the tabs in period 04. The first displays the time series data, along with a red line that will morph into our best fit model as we obtain it. The next cell displays a long scargle periodogram with a light curve. What this basically displays is, for a dense set of potential frequencies that could be present in the data set, what the corresponding best fit amplitude of a sine wave at that frequency would be. The highest peak that stands above the relatively flat noise background is ostensibly the most significant, most likely signal to be present in the data. Pyrid automatically puts a marker on this highest peak priming us to add that signal uh, to our frequency solution, but we could click around and uh, pick other peaks to try instead. Uh, but let's in fact add this highest peak uh, to see what happens in the signals cell. So the signal cell displays a table that describes our model. We now have a signal in our table called F0 there's an estimate of frequency and amplitude from the periodogram 
And we'll use these as starting points for obtaining a least squares fit to the time series data. Our overall model is a sum of sinusoids, one for each row in this table, each with its own best fit frequency, amplitude, and phase. Just click Refine Fit to obtain these values. We can now see that there's a error measured for this frequency, uh, an error for amplitude, and a value, and an error for phase. Scrolling back to the periodogram cell, we now see two different periodograms displayed. In blue is the periodogram of the residuals. This is the difference between our best fit sinusoid and the original time series data, which allows us to search for additional signals that may be present. This is the nature of the pre-whitening procedure. We subtract our best fit model to search for additional significant signals in what remains. I like to imagine this noise like a like a bunch of grass growing along the bottom of the periodogram plot. And basically it's our job to mow this lawn to go through and add uh, signals corresponding to the high peaks until what's left is relatively flat. In green, we have a periodogram of our current model sampled at the times of the ZTF observations. All of this that you see in green is caused by a single noiseless sinusoid, including multiple high peaks um, that might look like uh, things that we would want to add to our frequency solution. All the peaks that do not correspond to the intrinsic frequency of variability are called aliases, and they're called, caused by gaps in the data. ZTF data has lots of gaps, and like any single site observatory, the most prominent gaps are from the sun rising every day. These many sets of signals, these tallest ones, are separated by one cycle per day. They basically represent our uncertainty about exactly how many variability cycles we missed when we weren't collecting data. The correct frequency does not always correspond to the highest peak, especially for low amplitude signals or short time series. So it's advisable to test a few different frequency solutions that incorporate different peaks into the analysis. If we were looking at nearly continuous data without gaps, such as test data, this model periodogram would only have one real standout peak. The red line in the time series cell now shows the best fit sinusoid that has so many cycles over four years, it's all scribbled over itself. But we can zoom in and see how well the data appear to follow the model we have so far. Sure enough, I'd say the data seem to follow this sinusoidal trend fairly well. You can also fold the light curve on the best fit period to see how things look. There's definitely a signal at this frequency, but there's a region where the data diverges a bit. From experience, I know that contact binaries usually have their strongest sinusoidal signal at twice the orbital frequency, fitting to both the primary and secondary eclipses, which have slightly different depths. This is what we see here, where the light curve folded on the best fit frequency uh, seems to follow two different paths. The next signal we add will match the orbital frequency and we'll let every other eclipse have a different depth in our model. Sure enough, it looks like this next highest peak is half the first signal's frequency. We can add that to our solution and improve our fit. But physically, we expect this second, second frequency to be exactly half the other frequency. And slight differences in the fitting uh, will cause the apparent shape of the light curve model to vary slowly over time. So instead of this, let's, let's delete this second row and recover our original fit. And then instead of including the best fit frequency here, we'll write an expression for the new sig signal as F0 over 2, which gives us a much more reliable result. If 
we take a look at the time series model now, we'll fold it on this new frequency, and sure enough, this seems to fit much better. Similarly, we recognize the next signal to correspond to two times F0, and we'll add that and further refine the model. The next appears to be about three halves F0. Remember that F0 over two is the orbital frequency. So this is really the third harmonic of the orbit. Okay, now what to do about this next peak. This peak does not correspond to a multiple of the orbital frequency. But remember that the same underlying signal is responsible for all of these peaks that are separated by one per day. And in fact, this next one over here is three times F0. So we'll add that using our knowledge about uh, binary orbits, uh, that everything should be a harmonic of the underlying frequency to pick out the correct signal amongst this set of aliases. But this demonstrates that we're getting to the point where the noise in the periodogram is sufficient compared to the amplitudes of the signals to cause incorrect frequencies to have higher peaks than the actual peaks corresponding to the intrinsic frequencies. And so we should start to be extremely cautious about just adding peaks because they have uh, the highest amplitudes. If we were adding independent signals rather than multiples of existing signals, we'd likely get this frequency wrong, and it could derail the entire process of pre-widening these data and lead to potentially very wrong physical inferences about the system we've observed. The more you work through the process, the more restraint you'll learn, especially with gappy data. This next peak doesn't correspond to any harmonic that we're interested in. In fact, I think I'll stop the process here. Finally, there's a fourth period tab uh, that displays a log of the calculations, the actions that have been taken. And I recommend saving that if you want to be able to reproduce your analysis exactly uh, at a later time. This brings me to my final point which I don't have time to get into fully, but that I plan to implement some functionality in Pyriad 4 in the near future. When should we stop adding signals to our solution? There are many approaches to this. A basic one I like is a bit computationally expensive, and I provide some code here to demonstrate how to do it. This is to assume that the residuals in the time series data are caused entirely by noise. And to sample this empirical noise distribution a bunch of times to see how high of a peak such noise could produce. Resampling the light curves will destroy any coherent signals, but if we see a higher peak in the periodogram of our data residuals, we can conclude that there's another signal present. This is called bootstrapping, and you have to do it a bunch to get a reliable result. Say we're willing to accept a false alarm uh, no more often than about one in 1,000 data sets. In that case, we need to calculate more than 1,000 simulated noise data sets. This takes about three hours to run, and so I won't run it now.
Note that this significance level does not mean that the highest peak corresponds to an intrinsic frequency. It just means that some additional signal is present. A different type of bootstrapping test that includes a injected signal is needed to test how high a peak must be to nearly always correspond to that injected signal. Also note that correlated noise introduces a frequency dependence on the noise in the periodogram. Well, the noise is relatively flat out here, it does seem to rise a bit at low frequencies, which could be indicative of some low frequency systematics in the data, perhaps uh, seasonal observability conditions varying. For this reason, it is usually a good idea to compute the threshold as some multiplicative constant above the local evaluated mean level of the periodogram. When in doubt, about five times the local mean level is quite safe. For a photometric binary where there's really only one independent frequency, it's reasonable to keep adding harmonics as long as the next highest periodogram peak is at least an alias of a harmonic, which we've already obtained. A sum of sinusoids is an entirely empirical parametric model and won't always be physical. Let's take a look at our final fit here. We probably don't expect these extra little bumps to be, uh, to be real. And more harmonics would be necessary to obtain a more realistic fit. In reality, we should always fit an eclipsing binary light curve with an eclipsing binary light curve model. But this process is a great way to pin down uh, what the underlying orbital frequency uh, must be that could aid your further analyses and to get a sense of what the underlying uh, variability might look like roughly. Finally, I'll note that if variability is not periodic, for example, if signals vary in phase, frequency, or amplitude, fitting periodic sinusoids will never capture all of the variability. But the pre-whitening procedure may reveal typical time scales of variation. So pre-whiten with caution and when in doubt, repeat your analysis many times with simulated data. I hope you find this tutorial helpful for your own explorations of ZTF data, and I welcome any questions, comments, or pyreid feature requests via email at keatonv at uw.edu. Happy fitting.